Stanford University. I'm Maria Denman, the Humanities Associate Director at the Center for Teaching and Learning, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Gabriela Safran, the Chair of the Division of Literatures, Cultures and Languages, and Professor of Slavic Literatures and Languages, and by courtesy of German Studies to you today. Now, a little warning. Gabriela will not just talk about collecting folklore and teaching skills, but she will also make sure that you cannot comfortably indulge in the role of a passive listener today. But before we get to this, let me say a few words about Gabriela. I met Gabriela in my first year here at CTL in 2005, when she invited me to talk with her students about their learning experience in her seminars and IHAM lectures. I was simply amazed by what I heard from her students. They univocally praised her enthusiasm and passion for them and the content of the course. They also stressed the various ways in which she engaged them and kept them on their toes intellectually. No sleeping in her lectures, for sure. In our follow-up conversations about the courses, I was particularly struck by how much she cared about what her students had to say and then was willing to make changes to her courses and lectures so that she could engage them even more. In the numerous encounters with her since then, I have come to appreciate her as an amazing teacher, intellectual, and person. And I'm not surprised to see that Stanford and the wider national and international scholarly communities have also taken notice of her. Let me highlight just a few of her many accomplishments today. Gabriela received her BA from Yale Magna Cum Laude with honors in Soviet and East European studies in 1990 and pursued a PhD in Slavic languages and studies at Princeton. Upon graduation in 1998, she joined the Stanford faculty and received early tenure in 2003 and was promoted to full professor last year. In 2007, the School of Humanities and Sciences recognized her stellar teaching performance with the Dean's Award for Excellence in Teaching. <coughs> Gabriela's meticulous research and prolific and engaging writing style has captivated national and international audiences alike. Her impressive list of publications on Russian, Polish, Yiddish, and French literary and cultural topics include more than 20 articles in national and international journals and anthologies. She authored and co-edited five books, not counting the Russian translation of her first book, and is the recipient of prestigious book prizes, such as the National Jewish Book Award, the MLA Aldo and Jean Scalione Prize for Studies in Slavic Languages and Literatures, the Best Book in Literary and Cultural Studies Award of the American Association of Teachers in Slavic and East European Languages, and most recently the Fenya and Jakob Leviant Memorial Prize in Yiddish Studies. Finally, she has also contributed to the Stanford community in significant ways as the chair of the Slavic department and the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. And as mentioned earlier, she's currently the chair of the DLCL and is deeply involved, as the homepage states there, in the reorganization of humanities departments and the implications of that for learning, teaching, learning, and scholarship which probably takes a lot of patience <laughs> when you do this. Now, when I look at a bio such as Gabriella's, I always wonder how someone does this. I mean, you have the same 24 hours a day. <laughs> what is it? And I don't know you that well, but I, I think maybe I have an answer. I mean, you have such a way of touching people. I think what it is, it's a certain deep passion for your scholarship. You really are engaged in it with your heart and your mind. And you also touch people by bringing this out. You have an amazing way of touching them for who they are. I, I really appreciate every conversation I have with you in your way. You're passionate. You're passionate for everyone. You're compassionate. And you always feel, you know, I feel always welcome when I talk with you. And I think that's what I have picked up from your students. And I think that's what we will see today. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Gabriela Safran. Wow, thank you, Mariette. That was an incredibly generous and, and kind introduction. Um, and thank you to the CTL for inviting me to give this talk today. 
Um, so as you know about me, I teach in the Slavic department. I, um, I work on the intersections of Slavic and East European Jewish literat um, literatures and cultures. And I teach courses mostly on those areas, on 19th century Russian literature and Yiddish literature um, and, and kind of things related to them. And lately, as Mariat explained, I've been doing a lot of administrative work. So um, I was running the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies for three years. And now I'm chairing the Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages. Um, and because of doing these, um, this administrative work, I find myself more and more in positions where I'm being asked to think uh, kind of in a broader, more global way than I ever have before about teaching and issues of teaching in the humanities um, and how, how teaching is organized here at Stanford and in general in the US. Um, so because, because of this, uh, this position that I find myself in, um, I, I decided that I would like to talk today um, not about my kind of standard teaching experience, which is you know, big lectures for IHUM or small department seminars. But, uh, but rather, I would talk about a one-time experience, a one-time teaching experience that I had last year when I taught a right to class, a power to class, and I'll explain what that is, um, on folklore. This was a class that allowed me to experiment with some, some of my kind of current ideas about thinking, and, about teaching and how teaching is organized. Um, and especially this allowed me to think about the relationship between teaching skills and teaching content, or teaching, I, I kind of want to put quotation marks around that, teaching skills and teaching content, um, which I'm not sure uh, we need to divide up the way we do. There is a belief at Stanford, and I think nationally, that, um, that you can really separate skills from content, that you can learn skills um, like writing, skills, reading skills, foreign language skills, that you can learn them um, in one place, like maybe in high school, or you can learn them from a lecturer or a graduate student, you can learn them, um, and, and it's kind of, they're like sort of an object that you purchase. You get these skills and they're like um, a computer or maybe something low-tech, like uh, pencil and paper. And you get these skills and you put them in your backpack and then you put on your backpack and you go off to a content class um, taught by a latter faculty member and there you take your skills out of your backpack and you use them. Um, and I, I actually want to question that formula. I, I want to question that whole picture. I think that um, that kind of hierarchy that says skills are this lower level thing and content is this higher level thing and you get the skills first. Um, I want to suggest that maybe skills and content are a little more closely connected than we have been suspecting. Maybe skills are not just the, um, the pencil and paper that you have somewhere at the bottom of your backpack, but in a sense, skills are the backpack itself and they're maybe also how you wear the backpack and um, and the way you carry the backpack and the journey and possibly even the destination as well, the place you go to with your backpack. Um, so that's, that's kind of the introduction to what I want to say today. My talk will be in three parts. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about what is folklore. Since I'm going to tell you about this folklore class I taught, and we don't teach a lot of folklore classes at Stanford, so I'll explain what folklore is. Um, as a scholarly endeavor. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what right to or power to is, what this genre of class is that I was teaching in. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about skills versus content. So, um, so what's folklore? Well, I think we know what folklore is. Uh, um, we have this, uh, this sort of association. We, we think folklore is fairy tales, epics, uh, jokes, riddles, songs. Uh, we tend to think of folklore as um, texts that were collected in some non-urban place, in some uh, maybe an Irish village or Appalachia, 
somewhere far away from Palo Alto. Uh, um, one definition of folklore is artistic communication in small groups, uh, um, which, which sort of broadens that out a little bit, right? If it's artistic communication in small groups, that could also be happening in Palo Alto, right? It doesn't have to be in Appalachia. Uh, um, and another sort of important thing about folklore is that it's, it exists, it's texts that exist in multiple variants, right? So you don't have a single version that's kind of canonical and correct of an epic or, or a fairy tale or whatever. You have various versions, and the existence of various versions makes it folklore. Um, folklore can mean texts. It can also mean uh, rituals. It can mean objects. It can be, it can be seen a little more broadly. Um, in the 19th century, in the first half of the 20th century in Europe, um, you tended to have people uh, collecting folklore in rural places, in villages or wherever, um, and then taking this folklore that they'd collected to cities and uh, processing it there, thinking about it, analyzing it, publishing it, and, and using it as part of nationalist projects. Right, so the history of folkloristics is tied up with the history of the idea of the nation. And there was this sense that if you wanted to figure out what it meant to be, say, Czech, then you would need to go and collect some Czech folklore. And then you would bring it back to, to Prague and you would process it and you would publish it and maybe you would write operas based on it or something. And that would sort of further your project of being Czech. Um, Today, folklore, folklore is seen more broadly. Folklorists collect more broadly, not only in villages, but, um, but elsewhere, like Palo Alto. Um, and it's less frequently the case that the motivations of folklorists are primarily nationalist, although sometimes their motivations still are. Um, and the folk itself is defined differently from how it was in the 19th century. Right, so if in the 19th century there was this sense that sort of folklore is what you get from the folk from an ethnicity, today folklorists say um, you can collect folklore from any group of people that share any single factor, any single feature. So it could be all the people in a family or all the people who live in a dorm or all the people who are on a sports team. They have their own folklore and that's legitimate folklore, we would say now. Um, so, so folklorists today collect all kinds of things that you wouldn't have recognized in the 19th century as folklore, like internet rumors um, or camp songs. Um, and they continue to collect these sort of familiar genres like jokes and legends and so on. So, um, so then what do they do with folklore if their, their goal is no longer to construct a nation? Then what do, what do folklorists do with the stuff they collect? And the answer is, they use, it to, um, they use it to respond to various kinds of questions. Here, here are some of the kinds of questions that they tend to respond to. Um, they can respond to questions of poetics, questions of form, of textual form, literary form. They can say, um, they can ask, what are the formal features of a given folkloric genre that make it, that make it work, that make it durable? and memorable and shareable and circulable, right? Um, for example, here's, here's one kind of uh, poetic uh, form or poetics, uh, sort of an example of poetics in folklore. There's something called the Slavic antithesis or negative simile that appears in Slavic epics. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's when you, you ask a question or a question may just be implied and you give one answer to the question that's wrong, and then you give the correct answer. So it's kind of like, um, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's... Superman. Right, so that's the Slavic antithesis, kind of. Well, it's not Slavic. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you could have, it's a bird, it's a, is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's not a bird. It's not a plane. It's Superman. So that would be a kind of very full form of the Slavic antithesis. From, uh, from a Russian folk song, you have, it is not a falcon flying down the road. It is not a falcon shedding gray feathers. A young man is flying down, is galloping down the road. Bitter tears are falling from his eyes. So that's, that's an example of a kind of poetic device 
that's used to organize, um, that, that works inside Slavic epics, and it actually appears outside of Slavic epics and other kinds of other genres of folklore from other countries, but it's called the Slavic antithesis. Um, and if you're the performer or the listener, um, and suddenly this Slavic antithesis appears, that helps you understand what you're hearing, right? It, it helps it work for you. Um, it helps it function. Um, this, is, this is a device that works a lot like devices that we're more familiar with. For instance, if I said to you, so, a frog walks into a bar. You know that that's the beginning of what genre? A joke, right, because we're familiar with jokes beginning a certain way. Um, so this is just one of those formal devices that makes it work. That's one kind of question you can answer using folklore. Another kind of question you can answer is anthropological questions. You can see folklore, like any literature, as being, in a sense, tools for living, right? We use it for something. It helps us. It performs a function for us. So you could ask, for instance, what's the function of all the legends that exist in, in Europe and outside Europe about vampires? Why do we need them? Why do we use them? Well, some people say that vampire legends arose because they helped people understand the decomposition process of bodies buried in shallow graves. And it's true, you know, if you bury a body in a shallow grave, it starts to decompose, various things happen to it, including movement, potentially, underground. And if you have these legends that help you understand why the ground is kind of shifting over this body buried in a shallow grave, okay, that's helpful. Now you understand your world better. I mean, maybe incorrectly, but it's still soothing for you, right? Um, or if you believe a Freudian analysis of folklore, you could say that we need vampire stories, or people, we ourselves may not believe in vampires, but people who believed in vampires needed those stories because they, um, they were angry at the dead. You know, people are often angry at people who die, their relatives especially. You're angry because they left you. You're angry for whatever reasons. And then to sort of follow a Freudian explanation, you project your anger at them onto them. And you say, they're angry at us. The dead are angry at us. And therefore, they would want to get out of their graves and come at night and suck our blood. Right? So that's, it's kind of an, it's an explanation that helps you make sense of the world you live in and the feelings that you're experiencing. Right? So that's another way that, uh, that folklore can answer questions that are useful. Um, you can also use folklore materials to answer literary historical kinds of questions. Um, you can ask, how does folklore resurface in literature or in films or in um, political rhetoric? And you can find folklore all those places. I challenge you for the next 48 hours watch out for folklore and you will see it everywhere. Uh, um, so why does it resurface? For instance, um, the Slavic antithesis resurfaces. There's a Czech play by the poet Čapek who where the following little bit of dialogue appears. Someone says, what is this? A handkerchief. But it is not a handkerchief. It is a beautiful woman standing by the window, dressed all in white and dreaming of love. That's the Slavic antithesis reappearing in a 20th century play. And that, for the audience who knows what the Slavic antithesis is, that, that does something. That recollection, that reappearance of a folkloric bit of poetics can have an effect. It can remind the audience of something. It contextualizes what's happening in the play in some way. Um, and literary critics can look at that and analyze it and find out some answers to what it does. Or you can ask these same kinds of questions, literary critical questions, literary historical questions about vampire stories and what they do in contemporary literature and film and TV shows. How many of you have seen or read something involving vampires that's contemporary in the last year? Oh, some people are probably ashamed to say, of course, it's all very lowbrow. I only read those books because my daughter read them first. Um, so, so one could answer these questions about con our contemporary interest in vampires um, using poetics or kind of formalistic uh, devices, or you can also ask these same questions and answer them um, using sort of anthropological tools, saying how, how are contemporary vampire stories tools for living. Perhaps, as some people say, contemporary vampire 
TV shows and novels and all of that function in some way that helps us express or explore our fears about sexuality, about difference, about a changing society, whatever. You can make these arguments. Um, so those are some of the things you can do with folklore. Uh, sort of an introduction to folklore and an introduction to folkloristics and some of the questions it can ask. That was all part one. Now I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to do part two of this little lecture and tell you a little bit about the class that I, that I taught last spring. Um, it was a right to class, which means that it was part of the second, it was one of the, um, so our, our freshman composition series involves a, a power class, a program in writing and rhetoric class that's really very much focused on writing, and then a second class that also is focused on oral communication. And while the first, the first power classes are taught mostly by lecturers and graduate students, the power two classes or write two classes are also sometimes taught by faculty. Um, and I had spoken to faculty who had taught them and found them really exciting, and so I volunteered to teach one. Um, I had to really work the syllabus around the, uh, the requirements of the program, so I wasn't free to design the class any way I wanted. I needed to do what the program required. Um, I needed to have 15 to 20 pages of writing that the students would do and 20 minutes of oral presentation. And, um, I brought a few copies of the syllabus in case anyone is just dying to see it. Um, but you know, you don't really need to. It's just if you're if you're fascinated. Um, so the class that I ended up teaching, I gave the title um, "From Vampires to Bathroom Walls: Folklore and Literature." Because I'm interested in vampires, and I'm also interested in what people write on bathroom walls, latrinalia, which is another form of folklore. You know, Slavists, Slavists always teach vampire courses when they feel like they would like to get more enrollment. Um, I, have, I have a friend at Ohio State who, um, who taught a vampire course where um, he actually got the graduate students in his department to dress up in long black robes and white makeup and uh, vampire teeth and to go to the student center and hand out copies of his syllabus and each one had a plastic vampire teeth <laughs> stapled on and he just immediately got 250 students signed up. So, um, <laughs> so that, that doesn't really happen at Stanford. But I had been thinking, well, what if I teach a vampire course? What, what would happen? Um, so, so that was sort of something about the content. The structure of the course, which is what you do with Power 2 classes, is that um, it, the content is really front-loaded. So the first half of the quarter, they're doing a lot of reading. And the second half of the quarter, they're, um, they're doing a lot of writing and a lot of presentations. So I divided the, um, the quarter up into, um, into units um, to get them to read both history and theory of folklore and some folkloric texts and also some literary texts, um, including Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is wonderful. Um, I had a unit on mermaids and then a unit on um, vampires, of course, and one on dibuks. Dibuks are this um, Jewish legend that uh, someone dies and their soul can't find rest in the afterlife and it has to go and inhabit a living person. Uh, um, very scary. So that was one unit, um, and then uh, there was a unit on Stanford lore, dorm lore, children's lore. Um, and each student had to, um, they had to read this uh, sort of folklore theory, understand something about the history of folkloristics, read these, you know, kind of exotic stories, exotic lore about mermaids and vampires and things they themselves, for the most part, don't believe in. Uh, but I also made the students collect lore from each other. And I thought since, since we have time today, I would ask, actually ask you guys to do that. So, so for the next five minutes, can you each turn to whoever's sitting closest to you? And one of you can collect a little bit of lore from the other. So you have five minutes. Have fun. <laughs> No. <laughs> I 
sort of turned to each other and uh, looked, you all looked like you had something you had to tell right away. Uh, so um, usually if I were doing this in a class, I would have students report back. So you would have to tell each other's folklore and then um, not everyone, like one or two people, and we would talk about sort of how does it feel to be the one collecting? How does it feel to be the one collected from? How do you feel when you hear, hear your story uh, reported back, retold by someone else. And that helps us get at some of the issues that kind of come up in the history of folklore study. But um, you can just carry around with you the story that you heard or the joke or the song or whatever it was and you can, you can experiment with telling it to other people today and see what the result is. Um, what, what I found uh, worked in, in my, um, my Write to class was um, Partly that I think they liked, they liked the kind of interactive aspect of, of folklore and the, the actual experience of collecting something 
felt exciting to them. It made them feel, I think, somehow uh, capable, which, uh, which was good. Um, I really liked how they had to give all these oral presentations, and we had to think a lot about oral presentations. And at the same time, we were thinking about folklore. And we found ourselves asking the same kinds of questions of oral presentations that we were asking of um, you know, legends and fairy tales and jokes, which is what makes it work when it works, right? What makes, what makes a joke work? What are the devices that make it work? What are the aspects of performance that make it work? And when, you, when you're already asking those questions, it's a little bit easier than to ask about yourself. What made my three-minute three presentation work? Or what made it really not work? Um, what makes it sort of durable? Um, circulable. Well, you don't necessarily want your presentation to be circulable, but what, what makes it work? Um, I felt that the students got very engaged with the topic, so they each really came in with some one topic that they wanted to pursue throughout the quarter, one folkloric topic, um, and they, they really, for the most part, stuck with that topic throughout the quarter and kept coming back to it and um, and were really devoted to it and their work got more and more sophisticated over the course of the quarter. Um, something that I found very exciting about this class is that it put me in touch with students that I stay in touch with. So I have a student going to Turkey this summer to take photographs and stay on her relatives' couches <coughs> and somehow think about folklore. And I have another student going to France where she will uh, work on organic farms and ask people about fairy tales. Uh, sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so so that, that kind of ongoing experience or sort of ongoing connection to, st to students is something that kind of grew out of this class more than I saw it grow out of my other classes. Um, there were certainly things that didn't work so well with this class for me. Um, I never felt that I really got it, had a good timing device for timing their three-minute presentations, and I kept cutting them off slightly early or slightly late. Um, and there, was, there were a lot of organizational issues with, I mean, this class had a lot of moving parts, and I kept feeling like I was losing hold of some of them. Um, and I felt, I was concerned that I kind of was uh, uh, emphasizing the collecting of folklore over literary approaches to folklore and that a lot of the students were interested in literary approaches and we didn't have enough time in class to think about them. But I hope that I'll reteach the class someday and be able to fix, uh, fix the things that didn't go so well. Some, some projects that I thought were really great came out of the class. Um, some of my favorite papers were on, um, there was one on Romanian Christmas carols. Uh, there was one on Bigfoot legends. The plural of Bigfoot is Bigfoots, by the way. It's not Big Feet. Uh, um, there are all these people who believe in Bigfoot. And my student came into the class, very tall student, came in saying, I am interested in big Bigfoot. And he just dug up these people who, who believe in Bigfoot. He found a local Bigfoot guy with a, I mean, not a real Bigfoot, but a, a Bigfoot enthusiast who runs a Bigfoot museum in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Amazing stuff. <laughs> Um, there was a really great paper on Mormon camp songs, Mormon girls camp songs, and how they're the same all across the country. Um, wonderful paper on flamenco dancing um, by, by students who really came in knowing a bunch about the topic and wanted to take it yet further. Um, I wasn't 100% convinced about the final assignment that I had um, came, come up with for the class, which was a, a performance. So students, the last thing they had to do was perform either a piece of folklore that they'd collected or maybe a little skit about the process of collecting folklore or something based on folklore they'd collected. So it didn't overall work that well. But one student came up with this really excellent um, dance song about the reptilian conspiracy theory. Um, that's the theory that all of our political leaders have been taken over by these kind of reptiles. Very interesting. It's all <laughs> over the internet. Um, and, and his song is pretty good. I thought about playing it for you all, but it's sort of technically complicated. But if any of you really want to hear this song, it's called Aliens Party 2. Um, <laughs> send me email, and I'll send you a link. Um, so that's a little bit about the class itself. That's sort of part two of this lecture. And now just for a few minutes, um, I'll tell you some conclusions that I came to out of this teaching experience. Um, conclusions about skills and content. Um, this class, I felt,
gave students a place to develop their skills of writing and oral presentation, which is good because it was supposed to develop their skills of writing and oral presentation as a write to class. Um, and I think it also gave them um, a chance to practice skills, to develop their skills of literary analysis and close reading. And for a surprisingly large number of students, it gave them a chance to develop skills in foreign languages. Um, so these are all kind of things we really think of as skills. Um, at the same time, this class, I think, gave students a bunch of content. Um, there were uh, sort of details. They learned a lot about vampires and their alternative lifestyles. Um, they learned about the Slavic antithesis. Um, but they also learned a lot about the, the history of folkloristics, the history of how people have thought about folklore over the last 200 years, which is also kind of intellectual history. It's bound up with a lot of other things in intellectual, the intellectual history of the last 200 years. Um, and it's also bound up with the history of literary theory. So we were kind of going over all of that, I think, very important ground um, with these students. Um, and I think that, I mean, I hope that the students came out of this class with an awareness of how certain, certain approaches to text, certain interpretive approaches are linked historically to certain ideas about the nation, about ethnicity, about knowledge, progress, time, and space. So big, uh, big issues come into play when you're analyzing text, and I wanted students to be more aware that that was happening. When they're analyzing text just in their regular life, not only when they're sort of formally analyzing text in a class. Um, a really big question that this class forced the students to think about was the question of authenticity. Um, I found that the students tended to come into the class with, uh, with a very great certainty that some things are authentic, authentic and other things are not authentic. They tend to feel that some people, maybe their parents or their grandparents or their language teachers, are authentic that people somewhere other than Stanford or other than the US or living sometime other than the 21st century are authentic, but that they themselves, our students, feel that they are not authentic, I believe. Um, our students are, as we all know, very energetic and capable and forward thinking and ambitious. Um, we, we fault them sometimes for thinking too much about the future and for thinking especially too much about their own futures. But what I saw in my folklore class made me feel that our students are also a nostalgic generation. They believe that they have come after something, that it is too late for something, that uh, something very precious, which may be cultural or historical or ecological or moral, something is on the verge of extinction, or perhaps it is already gone. In this class, I tried to get my students to become more skeptical about their own notions of authenticity. I wanted them to approach this question of authenticity, um, to approach kind of claims of authenticity with the question, who is claiming that something is real, that something is authentic? Who is making this claim and why? Who is benefiting from the making of this claim and why? How do they themselves, my students, how do they benefit from asserting or believing that, say, certain flamenco moves are authentic while others are inauthentic or modern? And what are the, what are the implications of this kind of claim, not just for the dancers, but for the audience, the restaurant owners, where flamenco is often performed in restaurants, I've learned. Um, all, all of these people, what's bound up with this claim? Um, and, and I think that this, this issue of authenticity is connected to the issue of skills versus content. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> students who, who think that something else, someone else, contains, uh, sort of is authentic, but oneself, one is not, this, this leads my students, this leads students, I think, to be kind of hesitant and cautious in their approach to research and analysis. It leads them to be somehow curatorial 
rather than analytical in approaching texts or situations. And I think this is especially the case with language skills, with foreign language skills. I think um, our students tend to feel that, I mean, they've mostly studied foreign languages, and many, many of them are heritage speakers of foreign languages. So they speak, they speak it at home, but they don't speak it as well as their parents, um, and definitely not as well as their grandparents. And, and this, this sense that they, they tend to feel that their language skills are not authentic, that they, in a way, are not authentic as speakers of some foreign language. Someone else is authentic, their parents, their grandparents, their teachers, but not them. And this, this fear of inauthenticity leads them, I think, to be reluctant or makes them reluctant to use their foreign language skills for research. It makes them reluctant to take their foreign language skills into a, a content class and try to actually use those skills to find out new information. Um, this is something that, as the chair of the Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, I've become really fascinated by, because we have hundreds and hundreds of students at Stanford who take um, second year foreign language. They do it not because of a language requirement, because our language requirement is only one year. Right? So pretty much out of interest, they take second year language, and then very often they stop. They don't take third year language. They don't take literature classes taught in the language. And if you talk to them, so I've been talking to them and running these um, sort of focus groups and surveying students and trying to figure out what makes them stop. And they say, among the many things they say, um, is this sense of it's too hard. You know, I can get to the end of second year language, but I can't go on because that would require me to do these kind of grown-up things with the language, and I can't, I can't do that. I'm not ready for it. Um, and in a way, I feel that this is... This is another um, kind of fear of inauthenticity that really lines up with that sort of anxiety around inauthenticity that came out in the folklore class. Um, and I feel like one thing that was exciting for me about the folklore class was that a lot of students, many of them heritage speakers, but some of them classroom learners, were, were for the first time using their foreign language skills to answer sort of intellectual questions, to answer questions taught uh, from a content class. They were going and interviewing their parents or their grandparents or whoever, or reading texts that they found in books or on the internet, and they were really using those foreign language skills for something outside of a foreign language classroom. And I feel like the more we could do that, the better. Um, and they were learning from each other how to do it. They were watching each other do these you know, infinitely many oral presentations. Um, so they all were very aware of each other's projects. And they were seeing you know, this person, she's using her Romanian. So I guess I can go use my Turkish, even though I'm, I feel very shy about my Turkish. Um, they, uh, I also think that there's um, this kind of tie between content and skills that was so vivid to me in the situation around foreign languages in this classroom also was uh, vis visible to me in, um, in the connection between uh, sort of content and writing skills in English, analysis skills in English. Um, I think that students, as students um, analyze text, write papers, they should be asking folklore-type questions. They should be asking questions around function and audience and poetics and, you know, when I'm using this word, who am I speaking to and what's the effect I want to get? These are, in a way, content questions. They're folklore questions, but they're also questions that I felt like it was important for my students to be applying to their writing. So it's another connection between writing and... <coughs> and skills, and I felt like the more they were really engaging with uh, folklore type questions, theory questions, the more their own, the more they were able to find their own voice for their writing and find kind of clear audience-centered ways to make arguments, um, you know, in writing. Um, teaching this kind of class, teaching a kind of skills-based content class, requires a lot of time. Um, and, I mean, as we all know, we at Stanford are in the process now of rethinking undergraduate education and rethinking our requirements for undergraduate education. And, um, and I know 
that this, this kind of intervention that I'm making today um, really uh, sort of intersects with conversations that are happening all around the university. And I'm sure we've all been part of those conversations perhaps many, many, many times. Uh, um, so, so I wanted to kind of clarify what I'm saying in relationship to what's happening at Stanford around rethinking undergraduate requirements. Um, what I'm not saying is that we should switch to some system where overall we have tenure line or ladder faculty teaching um, basic foreign language or freshman comp classes across the board. I think that if we, um, if we expect our ladder faculty to maintain research agendas and do administrative work, then they can't possibly do the entire amount of intensive teaching that, uh, that skills-based teaching requires. Um, I do think, though, that we need at Stanford, we need more conversation and interaction between the content and the skills teachers. Um, I think this goes for foreign language teaching, it goes for writing teaching, composition teaching. I think we need, in general, greater clarity about the learning goals that we set for our students and that this should be the case in content classes just as much as it is in skills classes. Um, and I think we need to work harder and more kind of systematically to discover and articulate the connections between content and skills that are as fundamental to our classrooms as they are to our students' lives after they pick up their backpacks and leave us. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions. How many students were in that right to class? Sixteen. And, and how, how did you work the feedback along the way? Your feedback to them? Oh, um, so there were sixteen students. Right to classes are capped at sixteen. Um, they apply. That was it. Was sort of gratifying to be able to only choose the ones who had projects that sounded interesting to me, um, and to not choose the ones who said. Um, I want to take a folklore class because it sounds really easy. Um, and, and how many applications were there for the 16 slots? 30, maybe 35. Um, how did I work? I mean, I think very traditionally, I just wrote comments. Um, sometimes I emailed comments. Um, I met with them a lot. Especially, well, you know what happens. You meet with the ones who are in trouble, and you meet with the ones who are very, very excited. And then there's some in the middle who don't really Anyone else? Just in the subject of inauthenticity, uh, that's fascinating. And um, I'm wondering if, 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 in a way, it was off the syllabus, but were there discussions about the fact that, you know, there's a kind of, that they feel like there's a world of inauthenticity that they're surrounded by? And that that's why folklore is a refuge from that. You know, it just came up all the time in ways I hadn't expected. So really, everyone, especially the heritage students who, but I mean, a lot of them where they had some kind of commitment to some form of folklore. You know, they dance, they do flamenco dancing and they've done it for a long time or whatever it is, you know, or this is the, this is the lore of their parents and grandparents. They, we just kept coming to these examples of, um, of whatever it was, of a Turkish legend or a flamenco <coughs> dance or a, um, or a Christmas carol that didn't seem right to the students, to the student doing the research, and we would talk about it. And the students tended to be, you know, it was just really interesting because their, their immediate impulse was very protective, was very kind of, I think the way that it was done in Spain in the 18th century, that's the real one. And whatever we're doing now may be fun, and it may appeal to audiences, but it somehow doesn't seem real. It seems inauthentic. They, they just kept coming back. They wouldn't necessarily use the word authentic, yeah. but they kept coming back to this sense of really wanting to privilege older things over newer things and more distant things 
over more recent things. Um, and um, yes, I see a student, I'm teaching an upper level folklore class uh, this quarter, and one of my students is here, so um, we just, I had those students, it was not a right to class, it was a very different format, but I had those students collect folklore, and several people came back, several people collected from their own, you know, parents or grandparents, and several people reported to me this sense of kind of, I heard one story from my grandmother and another from my dad, but I assume my grandmother's right. Right? Because that's sort of the more authentic version. Right? So it's really, it's there all the time. You know, and in some cases, of course, your grandmother's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I might go ahead and guess that in more than a few cases, uh, one of the issues with uh, the divide between skills teachers and content teachers and like languages is that there are a lot of uh, content teachers who maybe teach a language uh, which is not their native language. So, uh, American teaching German, uh, and they haven't taught a skills class in a long time, so they, they themselves may feel kind of inauthentic going back in there. Uh, and it's horrifying when you get to a certain stage in your career and you have to be humbled by going and trying out again and then re recognizing this inauthenticity in you as you're trying that. Do you think that student scholar might actually gain something from knowing that? A very ex experienced teacher struggles with the same issue of inauthenticity as they do, or do you yeah. feel like they would, uh, feel very uncomfortable recognizing inauthenticity in their teacher? That's really interesting. You know, I mean, I do think it's absolutely true and tremendously perceptive of you to say that this concern around inauthenticity is one that um, that troubles our teachers as well, and um, and I think they're. You know, with foreign languages, it's, it's an interesting question. I think in, for some foreign languages, the bar is very high. Um, and, and you're more likely to feel, you as a content teacher, probably feel more the need to be absolutely native-like in your language. And especially the, the most commonly taught languages, like French and Spanish, I think the bar is just super high. Um, I think for the less commonly taught languages, the bar is a little bit lower, um, and the sort of culture of teaching the language is a little bit different. Um, but but I suspect I suspect you're right that this is this is something that teachers think about too. I think that students. I mean, it, it's intriguing. I, I've been thinking about this. I think that some students really do want to know that. Um, you know, you as an adult, like I started, started learning Russian as, as an 18-year-old, right? And my Russian is pretty good, but it's not perfect. And, but in Russian, that's not so bad. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit more of a culture around teaching of Russian where it's okay for college professors to say, well, I'm not that great at slang, you know, I have a little accent, whatever. Um, I, I think that, and I, I think that's something my students are pretty happy to hear, uh, that they're happy to know that I'm not perfect, although I'm better than them. Um, I, I think with other languages, the bar can be higher, where students might be more critical and more feeling like, no, you have to be perfect. So, yeah. So that leads to then another question. Did you perceive students to see this as a developmental process? or a some have it and some don't. Their, their sense that someday I will be in a position to be, have an authentic opinion or to treat this in that way. Because obviously it's a developmental kind of way of thinking. What, what was your take on that? Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, it's a developmental way of thinking in that I think students at 18 and 19 who've just left home, and this is, this is freshmen in my folklore class, right? So they're especially likely to feel that someone is authentic and it's not them, right? But at the same time, this is a developmental way of thinking that's been uh, sort of dominant in how uh, people see folklore for about 200 years. We haven't developed out of it, really. We do still, I mean, folklore in general, there is still a sense, I mean, maybe not sort of contemporary folklore theory, but, but there's this belief, if you just sort of look at how folklore is portrayed you know, in the world right now, this sense that there's a difference between the authentic and the inauthentic, that's very prevalent, right? Um, I think in terms of uh, foreign language skills, 
students do get over the great concern with authenticity at a certain point. You know, if they persist with studying a foreign language, at a certain point they stop worrying about, am I just as good as a Frenchman or not? And they start worrying more about, is my honors thesis as good as someone else's <laughs> honors thesis? Which, of course, is something you have more control over. He's a holly. What to accent you will listen now to real accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for me it's a kind of historical day. I remember first time 11 years ago I was invited to, in 2000 to teach first time at Stanford. I am originally from Russia, you, see, you, you can hear. And I got two emails at that very moment when I was invited from two great American ethnomusicologists, Bruno Nettel and Mark Slobin. And both of them, they did not know that they are writing the same text. They congratulated me not because I was accepted to teach, but because Stanford, maybe for the first time ever, will learn something about ethnic. Eleven years ago, it was so exotic to teach something connected with folklore. And now, I guess this is a historical day. For me, it's a historical day that uh, Gabriela Safran speaking publicly in such a special audience, a special day about folklore. It's kind of, you know, a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> so it's first point. <laughs> Second point, about lessons of folklore. I'm glad uh, Gabriela raised the question. Uh, it's my favorite question. There is one moment which I would like to add. Folklore is a wonderful material for all philosophical approaches of today. And first of all, folklore teaches us to be modest. Do not pretend that you know the truth only you. And my concept is better. <laughs> you know, I remember one, one of my teachers, Professor Bogatyrov, uh, made one experience, uh, experiment, wonderful experiment. He used to walk from village to village, one region, asking the same question and putting down on answers, all answers. After, after that, he published a book about those answers. It was unbelievable. Within the same community, all people answer differently. So there is no one answer. I remember in my Soviet time, it was a camp Com com company, how to say, company campaign. campaign against uh, religion. So folklore is supposed to give material that uh, Russian people do not like religion. Of course. And they published thousands of proverbs and jokes and tales against priests, for instance. Now, when it's very quite opposite situation, everyone speaks about religion, they published numerous books from folklore that Russian people praise priest, praise church, <laughs> and so on. And you know, both of them were right. Because folklore has everything. So, and very last moment about authenticity. I'm glad you raised this question. It's a wonderful topic, wonderful topic, very important. Indeed, you know, I call it a little bit different, but it's the same. I call it primarily and secondary stuff. And you know, all of us, we are secondary. We have to admit it. It's not bad or good, but it's such a, such a situation. In, in comparison with what you call authentic, of course we are all secondary. All students, all professors, all, all textbook, all our language, all our accent, everything secondary. But it does not mean that secondary is bad. Secondary is a real life. And maybe always people used to to do secondary. In, in every epoch, they, they thought about something primary. So it's a wonderful topic. And I congratulate you and congratulate Stanford with such an event. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I've been very, uh, very lucky to have Professor Zemtsovsky here at Stanford as I've been learning how to teach folklore, something that I was never trained in as a graduate student or an undergraduate, and I've gone to Professor Zimsovsky and gotten lots of suggestions for books to read and uh, things to assign, and it's been really, it's been great. It is such a funny thing that Stanford didn't have folklore and it didn't have ethnomusicology. Absolutely. 
Um, but now it does. So we've actually we we've, we've hired an ethnomusicologist well, in our music yes, one, yeah. but so one is so much ever. more yes. so much more than zero. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's some some shift is happening. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question related to that, which is I, I'm wondering if there was any backlash against teaching folklore and against teaching these things that um, I presume some people would call, you know. Um, of lesser importance, or of less literary merit, or less rhetorical val value, things like that. And I can, I can hear, you know, that criticism already coming from some people. And is there an attitude um, about what kinds of texts are, are worthy of, of being the object of, of study? So interesting, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, in my department, I, you know, some people have said to me, I'm glad you like folklore because I don't like folklore. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So there is in Slavic departments, folklore is more canonical okay. as a field than it is in um, most other literature departments. And that's for historical reasons that have to do with the place of folklore in pre revolutionary Russian Academy and Soviet, um, the Soviet Academy. Folklore just has a very high status in, um, in the Slavic field. Um, and indeed, I think, you know, in my department, people did see it as kind of embarrassing that we didn't have this kind of class, and so it's a very basic thing. Um, I haven't really talked to people outside Slavic about this class so much, but I suspect you're right. I think it is, um, it's, less, it's less canonical in, in other national literatures, in the ways that other national literatures are taught. Um, but at the same time, it's... Um, you know, a lot of people throughout national literature departments are thinking about approaches that in various ways draw on the social sciences. Yeah. And this is just one of those. Um, is a lot of people interested in um, kind of anthropological questions, linguistic questions, and questions around, you know, analyzing a lot of data. I think we in literature departments are very good at analyzing a single thing. Um, but, but now I think there's increasing interest with the sort of rise of the digital humanities um, and, and with just sort of the literary, literary critical theoretical approaches of the last 20 years in thinking about, well, what if I don't just write about this novel? What if I write about the whole universe of stuff outside this novel? Um, and once you go down that path away from just just war and peace, right? You you go you find yourself in a universe in which folklore is pretty familiar and acceptable as a discipline. So I think this is it. Yeah, yes. it's the end. So thank you so much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.